I'm Holly Alexander and thank you for watching Thunder Bay Year in Review. Well, 2012 was definitely one for the record books as thousands of homeowners were affected by the massive flood that hit the city on May 28th. That story and more is coming up as the year unfolds. The controversial proposed event center kicked off the year, the announcement of the city's consulting team in January, in charge of carrying out the phase two feasibility study. The team looked at everything from concept designs, traffic studies, and the economic impact for the city at three different locations. They're the experts now to really move this project forward and answer really every question I think that possibly the public might have on this project. Tragic ending to a collision on Lakeshore Drive in January. Paige Maddie Gurney died from the crash. The incident happened when a car occupied by a woman and three children collided with a pickup truck. The impact sent two of the children aged five and nine to hospital in critical condition. Gurney died from the crash. OPP said the accident was caused from icy road conditions. In January, 65-year-old Michael Kelly was sentenced to life in prison after being found guilty of first-degree murder. The victim, 57-year-old Judy Tebow, disappeared in the year 2000. Four years later, her remains were found in the Dorian area. But it wasn't until 2009 when Kelly was arrested in Alberta following an undercover operation by police. The key issue for them to decide was whether this was planned and deliberate or simply um, a spontaneous homicide, as Mr. Kelly uh, admitted and admitted repeatedly during the course uh, of his uh, interaction with the undercover officers. It feels good to have closure from my mom, but no one really wins in a situation like this. Everybody loses, but at least my mom has closure. I feel good about what happened today. The city's conservatory was shut down in February after concerns were raised about the health and safety of residents visiting the facility. The closure was initiated after reports of falling glass from the roof. That's the concern as the, you know, the building is 45 years old, it is getting aged. Um, so there is some health and safety concern as it relates to the unawareness or not knowing when potentially the next pain would potentially fall. So those are the issues that we're dealing with to make sure that there's, you know, public safety is the number one priority at this time. The positive response to the city's waterfront development was slightly tarnished in February after its operating costs were revealed. The $600,000 price tag to run the new marina was a surprise to many, including the chair of the waterfront committee. After spending three years behind bars, a man on trial for murder finally saw his case before the courts. 34-year-old Andre Wareham was charged with second-degree murder in the stabbing death of 29-year-old William Atkins. His trial ended with a not guilty verdict, and Wareham was cleared of the charge. No, this is a tragedy all the way around. In essence, I don't feel that there was really any winners, but the justice was seen. This was self-defense. This wasn't intentional, and I'm just glad that it's over. The Atkins family, it's been a loss for them, it's been a loss for Andre, and that's something, it's not something he's ever going to forget. And, but uh, like I say, justice was served, and uh, we appreciate the jury's verdict, and they saw what, what Andre's been maintaining from the very beginning. In March, the city announced it was closing the Plasma Centre, which did not sit well with residents. The local Canadian Blood Services branch was shutting down due to the reduced demand for the product, which meant 28 people lost their jobs and the roughly 1,500 donors were no longer needed. A rash of Maxmart robberies in March caught the attention of the city's mayor, Keith Hobbs, when Thunder Bay saw four convenience stores victimized in as many days. And the mayor was looking to crack down on enforcement for the public's safety. And I think it's time for a full court press uh, with the police out in the community. So I'm really going to um, push him to, uh, to start attacking this as number one priority. As it turns out, it's starting to be uh, fairly easy to get you know, a relatively small amount of money. But certainly when we see the heightened uh, violence that we saw last night, uh, it adds to our concern. So we will be stepping up enforcement. The team in charge of the Phase 2 study of the proposed event centre came to the conclusion that a parkade would be needed if the city chose the downtown North Core location as the site for the facility. 
our parking consultant has indicated to us that although there is a, a reasonable number of, of available parking stalls as you look in the city, we'll probably need to top it up with, uh, with a parking structure of some sort if the downtown site is considered. And I, uh, that, that number might be between four and 500 cars. City Manager Tim Camisso says this is the first time he's heard of the need for a parking structure if the downtown location was selected. The cost of such a structure could be as high as $16 million. One of the region's largest criminal organizations was dismantled in April. Six men were arrested in a police blitz known as Project Dolphin. And Thunder Bay police say this string of arrests captured the kingpin of the crime syndicate. Thunder Bay police, in conjunction with the RCMP, OPP and First Nation police, executed a search warrant as the latest component of Project Dolphin. 38-year-old John Sikoris, who police allege is the head of a drug distribution and trafficking network, was arrested along with five other men. Police Chief J.P. Levesque feels the number of arrests made will make an impact. Well, this, this is a significant uh, uh, number of arrests that we've made. It's, it's going to obviously impact the, the drug trade and distribution of drugs within the city. Um, I mean, you know, we're not so naive to believe that this is going to end the drug trade in Thunder Bay, but it is significant. In April, City Council made a tough decision to close down Municipal Golf Course, despite some loud opposition. The vote would see the nine-hole course closed at the end of the season. I'm concerned that we've got ourselves into this mentality that cutting quality of service or quality of life services is what we need to do. I believe that investing in quality of life services is a good investment. We, we're to provide services, yes. Services that aren't available out there in the community. And don't forget, we're still going to have two golf courses after this, two. More than most communities. The municipal golf course closure was later overturned after several rallies in support of keeping the course open. And that decision was passed by a slim majority of councillors. The month of April saw an industrial accident that took the life of a 31-year-old Thunder Bay resident. The incident occurred at the Thunder Bay Country Club during construction of a new clubhouse and six-story condominium on the site. The victim, an employee of LTC Contracting, died after he was run over by a 30-ton dump truck, which was backing up at the time. Police never released the name of the deceased. Thunder Bay Superior North MP Bruce Heyer quit the New Democratic Party and since his departure will sit as an independent. Well, it's been very clear to me from the first time I went to Parliament that we have a very dysfunctional system. Parliament is an absolute mess and the three parties are so hyper-partisan, there's absolutely no cooperation, there's no discussion, there's no compromise. And I believe that voters really want their MPs to work together to make Canada better. In May, city residents woke up to find themselves knee-deep in water as Thunder Bay saw the third highest recorded rainfall in history, flooding homes, neighborhoods, and the city's sewage treatment plant. We'll have the devastating details when Year in Review returns. In May, the city of Thunder Bay declared a state of emergency after a devastating amount of rainfall flooded several areas, including here at the Atlantic Avenue sewage treatment plant. The enormity of the storm was seen within minutes as highways were completely washed out and basements overflowed with water. City residents were asked to avoid flushing toilets or running water for two weeks until the water restrictions were lifted due to the water pollution treatment plants shutting down operations. Our primary plan according to emergency response protocols is to set up bypass pumps which we have done and they're currently in operation, but they have extremely limited capacity. And the second is, is to pump out the plant. Again, crews have been dispatched to pump out the plant so we can make some damage assessments. At this point in time, we do not know what the timelines are. Complete assessment will take weeks and possibly months. I can assure everyone that City Council and the community will be given a full understanding of what happened at that plant. This is not the time to point fingers, if there are in fact any fingers to point. This is a time for response. This is a, time, a time to help people. Fire Chief John Hay says the city has not yet moved into a recovery stage and remains in what he called a consequence stage. 
People impacted by the flood are realizing this will be a marathon and not a sprint and have begun using the shelter set up by the city. Hay says there has been a huge outreach by the community and volunteers, but the city needs to control that support. The announcement location of a ferrochrome plant spurred hard feelings in the northwest in May. Cliffs Natural Resources revealed that $1.8 million chromite processing facility is scheduled to be built near Sudbury. Sudbury offers the best combination of transportation logistics, labor, a long mining tradition, community support, and access to power to support the viability and success of the overall project. The frustration with this announcement was most felt when the Minister of Aboriginal Affairs was called out during the news conference by First Nations leaders. They say so far this proposed project has no commitment to jobs or infrastructure for the communities most impacted. As far as I'm concerned, my advice to the chiefs of the area would be to, to perhaps reevaluate the support of the project. You know, sure, sure, you, you can have a smelter in Sudbury, but you still have to have the mine up there. If you listen to their, their announcement, if you listen to Joe Gabry at his luncheon last week, there's no real commitment to all they're saying is First Nation participation. They're not talking about the numbers, what that number means. It could be 10 jobs for our communities. So, I mean, when they sit down and put the real commitment and the real dollar or the real number to who's sitting there and how many employment, how many First Nation are directly employed. The city was slapped with a $320 million class action lawsuit in June. Watkins Law Firm filed a statement of claim on behalf of six city residents. At least 200 people are looking to join the class action once it is certified. The lawsuit seeks general damages of $200 million, special damages of $100 million, and $20 million for extended family under the Family Law Act. Among the 27 pages of allegations is the claim that the city failed to issue a flash flood alert and failed to staff the sewage treatment plant during the weather event, and it claims the plaintiffs have had their way of life destroyed. The Thunder Bay Interim Long-Term Care Home announced it was closing its doors in June. The 65 beds were officially opened in 2006 under a temporary license, and the aging facility was only expected to be in use for three years. And after doubling its life expectancy, the facility closed its doors in 2012. Ontario's First Nations were given a new leader in June. Stan Beardy won a close vote, becoming the new regional chief for Ontario. Beardy was the Grand Chief of the Anishinaabeaski Nation for 12 years before challenging and winning the Regional Chief of Ontario position against Angus Toulouse. After just over a year in operations, Global Sticks declared bankruptcy in July. The popsicle stick manufacturer was opened briefly in the spring, but President Reggie Nukovic was looking for private investors to help restart production. When that failed, the company sought bankruptcy. It's a sad day. I mean, you're, these are people that have got that had jobs, and obviously, uh, uh, this means a great deal to them. And I'm hoping we can still find our way to to find a solution to get the company back up and running. But uh, the challenge is larger today. Forest fire evacuees sought refuge in our city after smoke from nearby forest fires made life difficult on the Sandy Lake First Nation. Over 500 residents of that community were calling Thunder Bay home for a short stint while the forest fire danger subsided. A building that began construction in 2000 and was supposed to be open a decade ago received another setback. The board of the Agriplex Centre on Highway 130 folded in July. For the, the corporation, for the people on that board and, and committee over these last 10 plus years, I feel for them, I'm sure all of council does, because their commitment was 150%. They just could not find the funding privately to, to see this thing go. Uh, their hearts were in it, and, but it just didn't go anywhere. An initiative called the Northern Policy Institute was put in place in August, benefiting development in northwestern Ontario. The newly dubbed NPI from the Northern Ontario Growth Plan is responsible for making recommendations to government in terms of the region. The biggest thing is to establish uh, an institute that is going to look at policies that support job creation and economic development from a northern perspective and that it will be able to establish policies that northerners are going to be able to uh, accept and respond to. 
August saw the city searching for a big cat that was on the prowl. Initial reports said the animal was a cougar, but after several sightings from residents, it appeared the animal was more likely a lynx. Workers from the Thunder Bay Regional Hospital came across the animal around 5 o'clock in the morning in Lot H. It was acting in an aggressive nature and made movements towards them, which has now prompted the police along with the MNR to take to the streets in search of the animal. We have our normal uh, complement of uniform patrol out and uh, we've asked uh, obviously that they step up their patrols when possible to travel up and down. Uh, the streets and of course the bike paths. We have, um, as I said, the MNR is uh, apparently going to be bringing about, out an ATV and they'll be assisting us as well in going up and down in these areas. However, the city never captured the big cat. A ship's arrival saw huge crowds flock to the city's Pier 6 as the HMCS Ville de Quebec docked in Thunder Bay. The Royal Navy warship was here for a five-day visit as it toured the Great Lakes. Following an investigation into the death of a 65-year-old Thunder Bay man, a mock email was sent to Thunder Bay Media that prompted a human rights complaint by First Nations communities. Stay with us. We have that story and more as Year in Review continues. An investigation was sparked following an accidental email sent to Thunder Bay Media in September stating the Fresh Breath killer had been captured in Kenora. That was following a police investigation of the death of 65-year-old Adam Yellowhead. Native officials say the words and actions taken by the police chief and the mayor after the release was sent were dismissive. What a sorry and sad state of affairs that a member of a police services board, the mayor of the city, would draw these conclusions prior to any investigation. If it's a, a real independent investigation, they, they could have waited and said, uh, here's the findings of our investigation and present that to the families. Fiddler says the lack of follow-up by the police service has added more grief and suffering to the families involved. Chief Johnny Yellowhead is the nephew of the deceased Adam Yellowhead. He says the family needs further acknowledgement through a human rights tribunal. Thunder Bay's new courthouse is starting to take shape. Much of the exterior is complete and the windows are in place. The roads are set to be paved and most importantly, the project remains on schedule and is likely to finish on time. The trial of an OPP sergeant charged in connection with a fatal crash that claimed the life of 18-year-old Jasmine Venaruzzo pleaded guilty to the charge of dangerous driving causing death in September. Daryl Story made the surprising plea after reviewing the Crown's case that stated Story's driving the day of the incident was, quote, incredibly stupid. Story will be sentenced in the new year. The city's fourth homicide of the year resulted in the death of 52-year-old Sam Loritza. His body was found in his home on Belton Street. Loritza was due in court the week following his death on drug trafficking charges. While police would not confirm, the 52-year-old appears to be one of the people arrested as part of Project Dolphin, the major drug ring investigation. The team that was in place to complete the Phase 2 feasibility study of the proposed event center concluded in October that the downtown North Core was the preferred site for the new location. And that created a flood of reactions both for and against the decision. Port Arthur outscored Inova Park in four categories vision, complement to business, economic impact, and city building. The two sites were equal in cost impact and accessibility, while Inova Park won out in the parking category. A shocking announcement was made in October. The city's mayor, Keith Hobbs, resigned from his seat on the police services board. There were several reasons cited for him stepping down after two years, including numerous conflicts of interest caused by his former career as a police union president. And I found I was uh, outside the meetings more than I was inside and not being effective. Um, and they're telling me that I'm mayor for, or um, police services board member first and mayor second. I don't want that to happen. I want to be mayor first. And when I have an issue of uh, crime in the city, I want to be uh, unfettered and, and not handcuffed when I go and speak to the chief of police about issues. It was an emotional November for MPP Michael Gravel as he announced he is battling cancer.
Gravel was diagnosed with lymphoma, a type of cancer that begins in the immune system. Despite the news, Gravel plans to continue with his duties as both MPP and Minister of Natural Resources. Well, this is, of course, uh, very serious. I am heartened by uh, the assessment of my oncologist that this is a treatable form of lymphoma and the prognosis for a full recovery is good. In November, police made an arrest in a year-old hit-and-run case. The accident occurred in October of 2011 when a stolen vehicle collided with the vehicle occupied by Phil and Joyce Ryan. 60-year-old Joyce Ryan succumbed to her injuries. This investigation um, basically went on for 408 days. There was a, it was a very comprehensive investigation. It entailed a lot of interviews, a lot of investigative follow-ups on tips and leads, which finally led to the identification of Mr. Shabagamic. Shabagamic, who was originally from the Arrowland First Nation, has been charged with dangerous driving causing death and criminal negligence causing death, along with leaving the scene of an accident and possession of stolen property. After a year of finalizing a preferred location for the city's proposed event center, council approved in November to head to the next stage, the Phase three feasibility study. The consultants will take a more in-depth look at the final selected location, the downtown North Core. The city's fifth homicide occurred in December on McIntyre Street. Police responded to the call where a 48-year-old man was found stabbed to death and a 32-year-old man was charged with second-degree murder. Deputy Police Chief Andy Hay says the victim of 48-year-old man was rushed to the hospital, but it was too late. The victim, 48-year-old Martin Fabian Ashney Paniscom, was rushed to hospital by ambulance where he succumbed to his injuries. City police arrested this man at the scene, 32-year-old Jeffrey Morris Kakagamic, and charged him with second-degree murder and two counts of breach of probation. Police say that the accused and the victim are known to each other and that alcohol was a factor. Close to 400 teachers at 25 public schools across the city took to the picket line in December, protesting the McGinty government's controversial Bill 115. And the Lakehead Public Schools closed down for a one-day walkout and strike. As mentioned in May, the city's extreme flooding saw the Atlantic Avenue sewage treatment plant overflow with water, leaving the city without its facility in operation. But in December, following an independent study, the water pollution control plant affirms what the city always said. The plant did its job during the heavy rains. Independent engineer Troy Briggs believes even if there was advanced warning of the heavy rainfall, there was nothing that could be done at the plant anyway. He recommends $1.4 million in upgrades to the plant, but according to his assessment, there was no equipment failure that night, just too much water. Basically the flows were higher than the plant could handle and it just it flooded and there was nothing, there wasn't any equipment they could bring on, there wasn't, there literally weren't, there weren't any more tools available to them to address this, this event. Well those are the top stories that affected Thunder Bay in 2012. For news online anytime, log on to tvnewswatch.com. Thank you so much for watching Thunder Bay Year in Review. I'm Holly Alexander. A Year in Review was brought to you by Reed's Countrywide Home Furnishings, offering Thunder Bay furniture from the best manufacturers.